edition of East Coast Biases. Week six in the National Football League is upon us. Let's welcome in the triple threat. Raheem Palmer, Joe House, John Jastrzemski. A lot of games to break down. Play for Thursday night. Fascinating Thursday night game, which we will get to momentarily with the San Francisco 49ers and with the Seattle Seahawks. But there's a lot of extracurriculars, gentlemen, that we need to address before we start diving into these games. And Joe House and Raheem Palmer, I want to take you guys back to the summertime because I told the both of you, despite the talent that was on the New York Jet roster, I had a major problem with the idea of investing my good, hard-earned American dollars on a Robert Sala coach team. Well, five games into the season, in stunning fashion, I woke up, I did all my New York, New York stuff, late night Monday after the Yankee game. I woke up on Tuesday morning to about 50 texts celebrating the fact that Robert Sala is out. House, I have no problem with the move. He's one of the worst coaches in the NFL. Ulbrich cannot be any worse as far as I'm concerned, but this is where the Jets got this wrong. They have all this talent. They have Aaron Rodgers for whatever it is, a year or two. We all knew Robert Sala couldn't coach. Why did they mess around and bring him back in January when Mike Vrabel or somebody more qualified or more competent could be coaching this team? The Jets may not be able to recover. I don't care if they get a little bump in a week or two. They're not going to be a Super Bowl team. I'm sorry. Just too many questions, too many concerns. But they completely botched this by not having a coaching change in the offseason. No other way around it. Well, the coaching change I think that the Jets should have had in the offseason, JJ, is the offensive coordinator because he stinks and he has a mediocre at best quarterback who is directly responsible for the two and three uh, um, standings that, that, that the Jets have at this point in the season. The firing of Sala at this point is bizarre, uh, inexplicable. The issue with the Jets is not the defense. The defense is very good. Top of the league against the pass. We watch what they did to the Vikings. They didn't lose that game because of the defense. Their quarterback is the direct and proximate cause of the New York Jets losing that football game to the Minnesota Vikings. He missed a wide open Mr. Wilson. He threw the ball three picks, including a pick six. He's not good. The problem is on offense. The Jets are going to be good all season long on defense. The defensive coordinator and mastermind is Robert Sala. He needed help with game management. He was never good at game management. That should have been the hiring in the offseason. But the Jets stink because they have a bad quarterback and a bad offensive coordinator. Dream, that, that's, that's my takeaway. I think you have the right takeaway because I'm I'm really having trouble on what to make of this coaching firing because at the end of the day, it's like it almost feels like it came from Aaron Rodgers. And we know Aaron Rodgers and Robert Sala have been going back and forth. So it's like if you're going to keep the offensive coordinator and the problem is offense, how does that change anything? This Jets offense is 27 from points per game, 18 points a game, the 23rd in the EPA per play. 19th in success rate. So if you're not, you know, completely, you know, revamping the offense, how does that change anything? So I'm a little confused about how to, you know, go about this going forward. I know a lot of people are going to be betting the Jets on a new coach bump going forward, but I'm not sure I can do that. So I wanted to get to that, Raheem. And obviously on Monday, we'll dissect what we're officially going to do with the Bills coming into MetLife Stadium to take on the Jets and the amazing thing for the Jets is even after a coaching change has been made, even after all of these terrible offensive numbers that we're talking about, if they go and beat Buffalo on Monday night, they're in first place in the AFC East. So go and try and make sense of all that. Let's put the standings aside. There's not much precedent for a team that's in contention to go and fire their coach five games into the year. We've seen the bump before with the interim. We saw it with Jeff Saturday. We saw it with Antonio Pierce. I go back, Raheem, to Dan Campbell in 15 with the Dolphins. Came in. They're running the Oklahoma drill. They won two games in a row. And then the team kind of inevitably ended up where they looked like they were going to be at the start of the year. Mediocre and underwhelming. 
How do you gut feel foresee this change happening? Is this something that you think down the road can make a world of difference for the Jets? Is this not going to be a big deal? Or at least in the short term, is this something that can help them? What do, what do you make of this over the next few weeks? I think if Aaron Rodgers doesn't want Robert Sala there and Aaron Rodgers and Robert Sala are beefing, then this is a good thing at the end of the day because the success of this team they're going to go as Aaron Rodgers goes. So I, you kind of have to expect that they're going to get some improvement. So that's how I would approach it, but I need to see it to believe it. JJ, I feel the exact same way. The working theory, I'm eager to hear your your take on this. I'm sure everybody in New York has has the uh, heard some of this this rumor, is that Woody Johnson was embarrassed. He was embarrassed by the way his team performed in London and, you know, he was the he's the former ambassador to London, to, to, to the UK under President Trump. So he he arrived like the royalty that he believes himself to be. And then the Vikings pull their pants down a little bit. Now, again, let me reiterate the Jets defense was bad <laughs> that game. They gave uh, Sam Darnold a beating. I think Sam Darnold was hurt the whole second half. I thought the pass defense was outstanding. That whole game, the problem for the Jets was not on the defensive side, but the working theory I heard, JJ, was that Woody Johnson came back uh, very upset with that outcome for the Jets, and that's the reason that Salah had to go. Is there, is you hearing that up there in New York? Oh, 1,000%. All and right. We know Woody Johnson has a reputation for being an irrational owner, and you nailed it, House. He was the ambassador to the UK. That's a homecoming for him, and... He might have been down on things to begin with. And maybe as he's sipping his English tea and watching the first quarter and a half of the game and his team falls behind 17 to nothing, that set him off. I think that played a little bit of a role. I also think Salah lost the locker room. And Quincy Williams had a quote with my pal, Janae Coakley, who I work with over at SOI. And Quincy Williams is a stand-up a guy, as you're going to find. And he started riffing off of guys not being held accountable and how this quote unquote blank needs to change. Very blunt words. Then you throw in the whole cadence thing that was talked about last week in the Denver game between Sala and Rogers. There was a disconnect there. I love Woody Johnson saying he talked to Aaron Rodgers about this. And, you know, he did he talked to him the day before the firing, but oh, we did we didn't mention the coach's status. No, no, no. We just, we just talked about the amount of yards he threw. Yeah, okay. Good luck, good luck if you believe that one. But the bottom line is, to your point, I think Rodgers wanted him out. I think he was losing the locker room. But what kind of stability can you get from now a defensive coordinator who's got to go and become the head coach? You know, normally, Raheem, with these interims, I'd rather it be a special teams guy. I'd rather it be a tight ends coach because now you're a defensive coordinator has got to be calling a defense, but oh, by the way, you got to be in meetings for the offense. You got to be around the whole totality of the team. That could be problematic. So I think short term, Raheem, it helps. Long term, I have no idea what to expect. That's my takeaway. Well, well how can it help? How can it help? Are they going to play better offense on Monday night against the Bills? If you answer that question, that's the only thing that I care about. I'm not worried about the, the Jets defense. The Jets defense is doing what it's supposed to be doing. They could, they could certainly. Um, you know, improve against the run a little bit. And we'll see, you know, them against the Bills. The Bills will be a decent challenge with that. But I need to see Aaron Rodgers play a good game against, a, a, against a good team. And then, then we that. can start having a conversation about whether or not uh, the change has made any impact. The only game Rodgers has looked like the Aaron Rodgers of old was week three against the crummy Patriots. That's the only time. Even the right. Titan game, he wasn't any good. So Nothing. that that's a problem. And Hackett's still there. And Hackett's going to be there. Maybe he loses the play calling, but he's still going to be there because he's Rogers' pal. Okay. A lot more on the Jets and the Bills Monday night when we do it on East Coast Bias. Two other things I want to get to. Dream. Drake May in for New England. Jacoby Brissett out. I get why New England is doing this. You have a rookie quarterback with the way the rules are set up. You want him to play. The offensive line is horrendous. That's not going to change. I think this is clearly an upgrade for New England because I watched Jacoby Brissett play against the Dolphins last week. He stinks. He is an awful, awful quarterback. He can't throw down the field. He doesn't have much mobility. He's just not any good. Um, does this make New England more alive in the weeks ahead? I feel like they should have made this move last week against the Dolphins. They don't. It's a tough matchup, tougher matchup against the Texans. What do you stand on Drake May in Jacoby Brissett out? 
Well, I said the other day on our Ringer pregame show, I don't want to bet the Patriots until Drake May is starting. Well, that time is here. And, you know, it's unfortunate because they're taking on a very good Texans defense. Like, I would have loved if this matchup had come, you know, a week later against Jacksonville, who plays all that man coverage and can't stop a nosebleed. But it's coming here against the Houston Texans. And you look at the Houston Texans, they are 4-1, and one, but they have a point differential of minus 12. So that tells you that this team isn't very good at all. And they're laying six and a half seven here that seems a little bit too much when you consider that this is an offense that's really struggling they're 20th in epa per play 25th in success rate and they lost the league's leading receiver in nico collins with a hamstring injury he's on ir right now so it's gonna be tough to actually you know put this bet in but i might find myself on the patriots this week wow okay how's where we make a may i'm i'm pissed jj because the Patriots should have done this last week against the Dolphins. That was the game to let this kid get some of the seasoning, get the rust out, get see what it's like to be on an NFL football field in an NFL speed game. The Dolphins are the perfect warm up for that. So it might be the case, and I will acknowledge that the Patriots intend to lose as much as possible this season. I'm not sure what, to what end since they drafted their their their, their franchise quarterback, but. That would be the only reason to have played Brissett against the Dolphins because um, it it would have been a perfect spot for him to knock off that rust against the Dolphins and then come into this Houston game, a much uh, a different defense, uh, defense capable of putting some real pressure on the offensive line. But here's part of the, 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 the analysis is that offensive line is performing poorly with a one-dimension offense and a quarterback that can't move. Now, and we've seen this a little bit with these rookie quarterbacks, defenses have to take into account the possibility that the quarterback might take the ball and run for a, for a little bit. And Drake May is, did it his whole college career. He's, he's very mobile. That helps the offensive line if the quarterback can establish that uncertainty with, uh, against the defense. Also true, for sure, look at the splits since C.J. Stroud joined uh, the, the Texans last year. They're, they're not good on the road. The Houston Texans are not good on the road. They're not good against the spread. They're not good straight up uh, on the road. So I think dreams onto it. I think the Patriots are live. I just wish Drake, this was Drake May's second game, JJ. Totally get that. Now, the other bit of news I want to get to is involving a team guys that I think we should be looking to fade a lot over the next few weeks. The Vegas Raiders, the Raiders are now going to Aiden O'Connell at quarterback. They're trying to recapture a little bit of the magic they had last year. House, you saw them last week against the Broncos. They were atrocious in the second half. They make a quarterback change. Devontae Adams is nowhere to be found. Now my buddy, my pal, Christian Wilkins, who is a tremendous defensive player, who got paid a ton of money, might I add, is going to be on IR, and he's going to miss the next four to five weeks. That seems like a situation. You know, we were talking about the interim coach's house. It sure feels like Pierce last year was the perfect guy to kind of stabilize things. But now that he's gotten the job, it almost is reeking of like that sort of substitute teacher where, hey, we liked this stuff for a couple of weeks. It was great for a couple of weeks, but now all hell is breaking loose with the Raiders. I'm looking at them not only this week, but the next couple of weeks. That is a team that has fade, fade, fade written all over them. Yeah, I have to agree with you. And I'm, I was already skeptical with the, you know, the, 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 who's, who's, who's on, uh, who's coming up for business, you know, whole escapade, um, who's standing on business, whatever it is, I'm messing it up. But you, you guys know what I'm talking about, where they were, uh, guys not giving max effort. One of them has a, 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 a apparently hamstring issue, Mr. Devonte Adams, um, until he gets traded, then his leg, I think will be wonderful. But, um, this Raiders team, I, I, think we're like in that place where uh, Pierce has lost the locker room. I wondered about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's a shame because I'm prepared to fade this Pittsburgh team, um, especially after that knockdown drag out brawl that they had with Dallas, where Dallas really beat them up. Um, but the, Ra- the Raiders are not the team that's going to be able to bring that fight um, and bring that physicality. So I'm probably uh, going to stay away from that game, Jim. Yeah, that game is really tough because, you know, typically you want to you want to fade Tomlin as a favorite, especially as a road favorite, and you want to back him as an underdog. But this Raiders team is absolutely abysmal. 
you you, you saw that game last week with Gardner Minshew, they're about to go up, you know, 17-3 or so. They throw the interception, and then they just completely disappear after that. And you're just looking at a team that's 28th in that EPA for play. Like, I, I just – I can't back this Raiders team at all. I, I think it's going to – I think you're going to see a lot of the public on the Steelers. I don't know if there's a ton of value, but I, I think at, at some point, I think you're just probably going to see this Raiders team lose week after week after week until they fire Antonio Pierce. Yeah, I think they're in a very, very tough spot over these next few games. No Adams, quarterback change, losing a key cog in your defense. There's a whole lot not to like about Vegas. And I think we were on to the idea of them being a bottom five team at the start of the year. It's certainly playing out that way. And we are going to look back on that Raven Raider game. And we're going to be saying in week 16, if the Ravens are maybe the two seed instead of the one seed, yeah, we might be talking about Likely's foot being out of bounds. I know that might be a storyline. But we also may say, how in God's name did they choke that game to Vegas? I mean, how in the world did that happen? So something to keep in mind. All right, we got a lot more coming your way. We'll get to all the week six games of note. But when we come back, I think we have a fascinating opportunity in front of us, gentlemen, in the NFC West. And I think it's the sort of opportunity that may not be there on Friday. What am I alluding to? You'll find out when we come back. boys let's get to thursday night football it's a good one game that has a whole lot of significance in the nfc west niners going to seattle to take on the seahawks different coaching regime this is going to be the first time we see mike mcdonald and his team going up against shanahan we know what mcdonald's defense did to shanahan on christmas day last year where brock purdy was an absolute abomination and probably cost himself a chance of being the MVP. Now, I say all of that because historically speaking, especially in the last five or so years, the Niners have owned the Seahawks. They have absolutely positively owned the Seattle Seahawks. Now, before we get to this game, Raheem, we talked about this on Monday. I bet the Niners to win the division on Monday after they lost this game to Arizona. They were at minus 115. And my thought process is, yes, they have their issues. Yes, they have not looked great. I still think they're the best team. If you're going to give me even money with the Niners, assuming they win this game against Seattle, they're still in great shape to go and win the division. Is that something that you think is an advisable move by your boy? Or was that a mistake? I don't think it was a mistake at all. You're talking about a team that's two and three with a point differential of plus 20. Like they should have, they should be really four and, you know, one right now. Uh, when you consider the fact that, they lost two games in which they had a high probability of winning. Last week against the Arizona Cardinals, they didn't punt. Like, they basically lost their field goal kicker due to injury, so they couldn't kick field goals. They just they just had some, you know, some really bad luck. So I can understand the wager. I'm personally not making the wager, but I totally understand it. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, JJ. We talked about this on Monday. I think it's the best price we're going to get. It's not going to get any worse than this for San Francisco unless somebody, um, crew, like, unless Brock Purdy gets hurt, to be honest. Or if like, they lose. See, I, I think it could get worse, though, House, if they lose this week. And I think that's a part of the calculus well, here. Yeah. Is San Francisco <laughs> going to go and lose this game outright to Seattle? Because if they do, and then all of a sudden they're 2-4 and four, and Seattle is exactly where they need to be, then, you know, maybe I get a little bit of a better price. But I think that's part of the thinking, you know? Well, and I'll say this. Um, I made a very, very, very sizable wager for me. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not in the professional space like like the dream, but um, no. on the San Francisco money line, because I believe that the San Francisco team, I don't want to mess around three and a half, three. We got the, I didn't, I didn't get in early enough, but just play the money line for San Francisco. They are going to beat Seattle this Thursday night. It's a terrible spot for Seattle. We'll be able to handicap this game in, in a moment, but then that's the launching pad from my perspective, because dream hit it. He laid out the, 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 the numbers, the uh, Niners have played um, across the board in terms of both point differential and their high rankings on both sides of the ball, like a team that should have a four to one record. Uh, and they have two high variance, weird outcomes that, that put them in, in the loss mode with against NFC West opponents. I think they're going to write the ship and get rolling. Well, for reference, Niners on FanDuel, minus 115 to win the division. Seattle at plus 220. Arizona, plus 420. And if you're really feeling frisky, the Los Angeles Rams at 16 to 1. Now, for this game on Thursday night, 
And by the way, there's a 30, 30% profit boost on Niners Seahawks, which you want to check out on FanDuel Sportsbook. A little shameless plug. Niners laying three and a half at minus 105. Raheem, money lines at minus 178. Total at 49 and a half. I'm going to let you get it started. I think you guys know where I'm going with this game, despite the fact that the lines come down. Raheem, where do you stand, Niners, Seahawks, Thursday night? Well, Monday's East Coast bias. I gave you guys San Francisco minus three. That line is up to three and a half. I still like it. You look at the history between these two teams. Brock Purdy, 3-0 and against Geno Smith. Winning by average of nearly 15 points a game. He's absolutely dominated this team. And you look at what Jared Goff did to this Seahawks secondary. 18 for 18, 292 yards and two touchdowns. Let's look at the Seahawks defense. Weeks one to three against the Broncos. Broncos, Patriots, Dolphins, Bo Nix, Skylar Thompson, and Jacoby Brissett. They held them to just 14 3. Point three points per game. They were second in EPA per play, first in success rate, second in dropback EPA per play, first in dropback success rate, and 11th in rushing success rate. Now, you look at that same defense once they start playing actual NFL quarterbacks. Jared Goff and Daniel Jones, 35 points per game, 32 if you remove the block kick return. 30th in EPA per play, 28th in success rate, 32nd in dropback EPA per play, 31st in dropback success rate, and 27th in rushing success rate. This defense has had a ton of injuries. You saw Tyrone Tracy get off. You saw Ramondre Stevens get off in week two. So I think Jordan Mason should have a big game. The 49ers, they put up six yards per play uh, last week against the Cardinals, and I think they can replicate that against this Seahawks defense. So I love the 49ers, minus three and a half. I took him at three, but three and a half is good. I also like Brock Purdy over one and a half touchdowns. I like it. House, you're playing this San Francisco money line. Any other way you want to attack Thursday night football? Well, I am going to do some of these um, Purdy props. I mean, Dream just dropped one. Let's turn it into a full on same game parlay. I like the idea of Purdy's passing yards at 253 and a half. I like the over for that. Um, the, the, you know, Dream identified the uh, Seahawks are hurt at all levels on the defense. They have seven starters that either limited practice did not practice. And they're just, li- you know, limping in. This is not the right team to be in that position against. The other thing for this um, Seahawks team, this is their third game in 11 days. Uh, and they had to, they went to Detroit for a Monday night game. That was a knockdown uh, drag out brawl. They come home to, to, to go against the giants uh, on short rest and now even shorter rests at home against San Francisco and their defense was on the field for a ton of that game on, on uh, Sunday against the Giants. Compared to San Francisco's defense, San Francisco's defense was on the field 14, 15 less plays than the Seahawks defense. So I like Purdy to get loose. I mean, you could do a little Purdy over in yards, Purdy over one and a half touchdowns. Hold on. Let me, let me get one more leg in here. Why don't we do like uh who, who, Brandon Ayuk, his favorite target, over four and a half catches, boom, plus 287. Three leg, same game parlay, fellas. Well, I'll make it three for three here. We are on a united front on this game. I like San Francisco as well. Raheem hit on the pretty dominance that we've seen over Seattle. And I know Mike McDonald schemed up Brock Purdy a year ago. He did it with way better personnel. Seattle does not have the same personnel. They've had a lot of injuries on that defense. And look at what has happened to them over the last two weeks. They got smoked by Jared Goff and Daniel Jones without Malik Neighbors. Now, I'll give credit to Daniel Jones. He had one of the best games of his NFL career, went into that environment, and moved it up and down the field. The Giants should have won that game going away. If it wasn't for a fluke, fumble return touchdown, we're talking about that game being over and done with early on in the fourth quarter. I don't like where Seattle is at this point, and I think you're going to get an angry, ticked-off Niner team after what happened against Arizona. They'll have a kicker in place. The, 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 Raheem has hit on it. Point differential, the way they're moving the ball, they're going to win and they're going to cover this game. So go and take a minus 115 and also go and take a minus 3.5. They're going to cover. I think yeah. they win by double digits. JJ, I just want to add in, uh, you know, uh, we used that idea of McDonald scheming up against a quarterback as part of our analysis of the Detroit game. And Detroit blew that defense off, off the football field because when Mike McDonald was with Baltimore, Baltimore beat the pants off of Detroit because Mike McDonald had a very good game plan. And to your great point, an incredible set of talent. The Seattle defense does not have it. And I'm not worried about Mike McDonald scheming something up against the San Francisco team. He doesn't have the bodies, buddy. 
Roquan Smith and Kyle Hamilton are not walking through that door <laughs> on Thursday night. I can guarantee it. I love the 49ers. And just to another point, you know, head coaches, you know, rookie head coaches making their first start on, on Thursday night football, they don't tend to do well at all. So, um, you know, this is a great spot to face Seattle. Like the United front. Now, I do want to hit on this total, Raheem, because to me, Seattle has shown you they can move the football. San Francisco and Brock Purdy, obviously, have played very well offensively. 49 and a half. I hate taking high totals on these Thursday night games. But then again, last Thursday night, the Bucks and the Falcons were moving it like crazy. We come back. We got the rest of the week six card to get to. What a world we are living in when the marquee highlighter headline game is down in Joe House's neck of the woods. We'll have takes on the commies, Ravens, and a whole lot of games that are driving me insane because I have to admit, this is a really, really tough week. This is a really, really tough card, at least in my opinion. We'll get the guys' thoughts on that when we come back. All right, let's get to the rest of these week six games. Before we get to the headliner house, and I know we're going to. Raheem, I got to hit you on this. I went through, you know, my early prep work for the week. Got off the golf course, eating a little lunch, going through the games, trying to see, I like this, I like that, I like this, I like that. Is it me or is this week full landmines? I find this week to be very, very tricky. I don't, I, I don't know if it's me trying to get a sense on some of these two and three, three and two teams. If it's me just like, I, I don't know what it is. I, maybe it's all the baseball that's like, going on. Has this been one of the more complicated weeks going into uh, the early season prep that you found? I think, I mean, I think the NFL is tough every week, but I definitely think this week is tough because when you look at a lot of these games, what we thought these teams were at the start of the year doesn't match what they are now for Bingo. many of them. And you look at a team like the Washington Commanders taking on the Baltimore Ravens, we've had to make a large adjustment to the Commanders. So a lot of times you're asking yourself, is the adjustment too big? Is it too small? What are these teams now? And I don't know if we have a great idea of what all of these teams are. I don't think there's any great teams in the NFL this year. And when you have... When you don't have great teams, you have more parity. And with more parity, there's more uncertainty. So I think that's what makes it tough. House, are you having that trouble as you start well, to look at these games this week? Yes, because this is a slate with a ton of home dogs, which is always like, oh, great. Look at the opportunity here. But um, to Dream's point, the, the, the parity of it makes it super hard. Like, what do you do? The Raiders are home dogs by three points to Pittsburgh. Well, we talked about this on the show, the Raiders, so who wants to, to bet on the, on the Raiders? And then you have five games that fall into the absolute worst kind of Bermuda Triangle danger zone, which is, you know, the anything where a favorites, you know, five and a half or, or more. We have five of those games, including the Eagles laying eight and a half to the Browns that are that are dead men, dead men walking. Um and I don't, you know, look at the, the Patriots getting seven at home against the Texans uh, and, and the, the, the Panthers getting six and a half at home from the Falcons. I don't know, man. It's, this is this is uh, let's be careful out there. Week another one of those. Yeah. Uh, landmines for OK. How's your team? The feel good story right now in the NFL. They smoked the Sean Watson and the Cleveland Browns, even though we kind of thought that might be a trap game, rat line, whatever you want to call it. You might have thought that was the case. It wasn't because Deshaun Watson's the quarterback of the Browns and your team at the moment is firing on all cylinders. Baltimore is interesting. I would not be surprised, House, in this game as they're laying six and a half if they won by 17 plus points. I've seen the Ravens go down that road. I also wouldn't be surprised if this is a game the Ravens are up they're fooling around, and Jane Daniels steals it from him in the fourth quarter, and we're talking about what happened with Baltimore. Baltimore's defense, we saw what Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase were able to do last week. So I have to ask the resident Beltway man, where do we stand on Ravens commanders, Ravens favored by six and a half? Well, I'll start off with my regret that I can't join the good folks at, at, at Jimmy's Famous Seafood for their – their goat uh, tailgate, uh, that's a, a, a Ravens tailgate, but I would have jumped across because those crab cakes are absolutely magnificent. I would have repped for the C words. Um, this game is fascinating. I can't wait to see it. I'm wondering why it would be less total wise than what we just witnessed with that Ravens Bengals thing, because I think we have the same kind of explosive teams 
and Ravens games are, are averaging 57 total points. Washington games are averaging 54 total points. The total right now is 51 and a half. I don't want it, really want to mess around with uh, sides or, or, or money line, but I'm kind of fine with playing the over here, Dream. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Like, I, I think when you look at these two teams, the commanders are scoring on 40% of their drops. First in the NFL, 31 points per game. First, you look at the Ravens. They're scoring on 34% of their drops. Third in the NFL, 29 points per game. So you got two elite offenses here, and you got two bad defenses. So I, that tends to be a rep, recipe for an over. And when you look at the Ravens, last week they gave up almost 500 yards of offense to Joe Burrow. And Based on the way Jaden Daniels is, you have to consider him to be the elite quarterback. And I know that there's a lot of sharps out there who are going to say, oh, he can't keep this going. He can't keep this going. Well, right now he's going. And I'm not going to try to catch a fallen knife by trying to fade him in this Washington Commanders offense, especially against this Ravens defense, which is 25th in dropback EPA per play and 22nd in dropback success rate. So I look at this game as a game that's going to be high scoring. But I also think there's a rivalry aspect to this. We all know the DMV area. We all know Washington and Baltimore. Those guys are going to be in the club. They're going to be bragging to each other about, you know, who won this summer. So I think the commanders can actually keep this game close. And I think the commanders are kind of being a little bit undervalued because no one expected them to be where they are. Now, I know people are going to look at the look ahead line and say the Ravens were eight and a half this summer, but I don't think they've made enough of an adjustment. I think at six and a half, you're probably getting a bargain on the commanders, especially considering last week. The Ravens, they had the, I mean, they were in a dogfight to win that game. They were down 10 multiple times in the fourth quarter, had to go to overtime. Now you got to come back home and take on the commanders. I think the commanders are live. I get it. My gut feel is the Ravens win this game by double digits, but I'm done betting against the commies. I said it last week. All of my instincts pointed me to Cleveland. I said, I can't do it. I can't do it, mainly due to the fact that it was Deshaun Watson on the other side. I said, I'm not investing my hard-earned American dollars into Sean Watson for the foreseeable future. And this also kind of reeks of either Ravens or pass, and I'm probably going to pass. Now, this game I'm not passing on, guys. House, I love Green Bay laying five and a half against Arizona this week. I think Arizona, after the emotional win they had last week, right, against the San Francisco 49ers, to now take them and put them on the road, put Kyler Murray at Lambeau Field, the Packers, it's another week where Jordan Love is getting that much more comfortable. Packers have been a really good home team. This is the first time I think I'm fading the Cardinals all year. I I've been with them, I feel like, game after game after game. They got very fortunate to win last week against San Francisco. I don't like them here at all. I'm all over Green Bay lane five and a half. Yeah, I think you're on the sharp side here, JJ. And there's lots of evidence out there that shows – uh, the inconsistency of Kyler Murray as a quarterback of a team coming off of a win, coming off of a kind of comeback win like that. And, you know, G Green Bay, uh, it's, it's defense is near the bottom of the league in a whole bunch of different metrics. In fact, that is why I really liked the LA Rams last week and the LA Rams uh, on a success rate basis <laughs> far outpaced the Green Bay Packers. But uh, I don't know that this Cardinals team is built to expose the weaknesses on in the Green Bay offense. Um, and so I, I, you know, part of the thing that Green Bay has done defensively is turn teams over. I think they're going to be able to do that against uh, the Cardinals. Um, we are going to see Kyler Murray for the first time at Lambeau. But, you know, hey, Kyler on grass surface, it's a bad uh, number for him. So I'm I'm on uh, the Packers with you for this one. Uh, what do you think, Dream? All right, this is a tough game for me because when I look at the Packers, obviously they're much better offensively with Jordan Love than Malik Willis, but the defense still leaves a lot to be desired. Now, Jair Alexander, he missed last week. I want to see if he's playing because they're going to need him for Marvin Harrison. And when you look at the fact that the Cardinals, Kyler Murray is actually good as an underdog. 2-1 and one against the spread as a dog this season, 27-15, and 15, 64% as an underdog throughout his career. And, you know, five is always such a weird number for me. It's right in that dead zone. And I just, I kind of don't really know what to do with this one. So I'm going to stay away from this one, but I would lean towards the Packers. 
And I think this will be one of the more entertaining games. And uh, Podfather, if you're listening, I like the Arizona Green Bay as a part of the four box this week. Uh, Washington's a given, but that Arizona Green Bay game, it, it's juicy. Now, Raheem, your Cowboys. Last week, they pulled one out of the fire. It was ugly. It came down to the wire, but Dakota did what he needed to do on fourth down and a much-needed road win for your team. Now we get a rematch of a Monday night game, or actually it was a Saturday night game, with Detroit. Feels like they got job. We know what happened, the officiating, the whole storyline there. Detroit kind of used it as a rallying cry in the postseason. Well, the spread is much different this time around for Detroit and Dallas from what it was a year ago. We have the Lions as three-point favorites. The last time we saw the Lions, they whooped the rear ends of the Seattle Seahawks. Now they're laying three against the Cowboys. Is this a rat? I, I kind of lean with it being a rat because this line doesn't make any sense to me. Just makes from no a- sense, Raheem. Makes no sense. How How's Detroit not favored by five and a half points in this game? Honestly. That's funny. See, see, no, no, see, I was going to go the opposite. Yeah. I, I was going to go the other way. Like <laughs> with, da- with Dallas? Yeah. Look, JJ, JJ, understand. Yes. These teams played on December 30th last year. Oh, I know. Dallas was a no, huge favorite. The Cowboys were laying five. I know. The look at headline on this before the season was Cowboys minus one. So how do you get to Cowboys plus three and a half at home? And this has already been bet down to three. How do you get there? This line I think should it's the market house being out on the Cowboys. I, I get what you guys are saying. I, I totally do. From a look they, ahead standpoint, from last year's standpoint, I think it's the books have now adjusted house on Dallas and the injuries and the talent that's not as good as it was a year ago. Baltimore, Baltimore was laying one to this team on that's the road. It. That's so it. how could the Lions be laying three? And we know the Lions don't have a good defense. So Look, you can make an adjustment for Micah Parsons. You can make an de- adjustment for Demarcus Lawrence, but you're getting Deron Bland back in the secondary. And it's just, it's tough for me to get to this number. At the same time, I do not want to bet the Cowboys in this spot. 24th in EPA per play on defense, 23rd in DVOA on defense. And we know that Lions offensive line, they're going to get a ton of push here without Demarcus Lawrence and, and Mike, Micah Parsons. They're going to be able to run all over this this Cowboys team. They're going to be able to pass all over this Cowboys team. If you ask me, I think you need to be playing Lions team total over or just the over in the game. Maybe play Jared Goff over 240 passing yards. Jared Goff over one and a half touchdowns. You want to play some Jameer Gibbs props. I'm Ross St. Brown because I don't see the reason why you should be laying three, three and a half on the road with the, the Lions. I would rather play the props that correlate with that happening. I yeah. understand that. How it's this game to me, though, like Detroit seems like such an obvious no-brainer play. That's why I think it's a rat here, House. I, I'm staying away from it. I am not betting Detroit in this game. I think right you're now. right. It is a rat. And I also am not going to bet Detroit in this game. The only thing that I regret is the fact that the uh, Steelers, uh, the way that Dallas treated the Steelers coming off of it from a Sunday night. I don't know if that that's not really a rest disadvantage except for the physicality component, but Detroit has extra time coming off the bye, And that is that offensive line. The Detroit offensive line is an entirely different animal from the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive line and the ability of Detroit to establish the run a whole different universe from what we saw with the, the, the Pittsburgh bums. So I I'm wondering if there might be a knock on effect to how physical that Pittsburgh Dallas game was. Cause I mean, I still am, am just kind of taken aback by the <laughs> kicking that Dallas applied. They were that, uh, that defense, even with, uh, you know, names that, that you, 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 you have to ask their parents who those, who these young fellas are. They, they just beat the hell out of that Pittsburgh uh, offensive line. They put pressure on fields all game long. So much so that uh, there's like rumors, quiet rumors. Is Russell Wilson ready to come? I'm hearing that out of the Pittsburgh people. But look, I um, don't want to to do anything with the um, spread in this game. But I do like the idea of a bunch of Detroit props. And I'm going to do like David Montgomery rushing and receiving. That That's the guy I think that that um, they use to get the the – the uh, ball rolling downhill, and then Jameer Gibbs for the explosive. So I'm with you guys on on getting in on some of the Detroit props. Well, guys, when we come back, there is a rat. 
that I'm going to be investing in. We'll get to that on Sunday night. A couple of rats that we are sniffing out. Plus, we have our best bets for week six. All that and more. East Coast Pies, boys, are coming right back. All right, welcome back, guys. Let's get to the Sunday night game. You have the Giants with a better record than the Bengals. Hard to believe, House, that the Giants at two and three have a better record than Cincinnati. Yet, the odds makers are giving us Cincinnati laying three and a half on the road. Now, I'm telling you what I'm doing with this game, House, because I know how it's going to shake out. Cincinnati's going to win this game, by the way. I just, I can <laughs> smell it. I can smell it. I can smell it because Cincinnati's offense is back. We know their defense stinks. I cannot see Burrow and this Bengal offense falling to one and five here. I will have Cincinnati money line parlayed with something else I like. Three and a half, though. I'm just warning everybody. It is a Sunday night primetime game where the entire country is going to bet the Bengals. That is a buyer beware on the number. I'm telling everybody now, House. You know it and I know it. I, I'm right there with you. Um, I like what you're doing with, with the, the money line. Um, the important thing is that the Giants get neighbors back, right? That's what all the injury reports suggest. Every he's, indication he's cleared, is neighbors right? is going to play this week. Yeah, correct. So that that is what you know in terms of your handicap of this. Then you you have to to take that seriously. Um, this Bengals team is is such a conundrum. I actually was sitting down to sort of go through the schedule. They still have an angle, JJ, and I think maybe this could be the time to do it. To get to the playoffs, I still think that the well, Bengals. I bet it. House, yeah. I bet it the other day at plus one forty-five. So I at, bet it at plus money. What they have left on the schedule and what we're seeing out of the the offense, so like everybody's involved. The return of T. Higgins was was so impactful on l- unlocking Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow. You know he, he's. He, <laughs> he's fired on all cylinders. I mean, if, if they make the playoffs, I think there's a reasonable case for him to be in the conversation for MVP. He's not the MVP right now. So I might be looking at that market a little bit as well. Burrow for MVP. But um, I like the idea of, of not messing around with the points. Just just take uh, the Bengals on the money line. So I can't get there on the, the Bengals to make the playoffs. I think there's no value. You're talking about a team that's one in four but you're only getting plus 140 on them to make the postseason. I think if you're going to play this, you need to be playing the long tails. You need to be playing the Bengals to win the Super Bowl 34 to 1. Because it's just like if you're going to swing, swing for the fences. It's just at this point in time, and I actually have a cop for this team. And I'm looking at the 2021 San Francisco 49ers. They started off the season 2 and 4 and made it to the NFC Championship game and were up 10 against the eventual Super Bowl champions in the Rams before losing that game. So I think that's a good cop for them. And you look at this Bengals team, they're 1-4 and four and have four losses by a combined 15 points a game. Third in EPA for play, 16th in net EPA for play. So the offense is rolling. 34, they, they, they scored 33 points, 34 points, and 38 points three weeks in a row and only lost once. So we know that they're going to be able to score. Um, You know, for me, I mentioned the Super Bowl bet but I would also look at other long tail outcomes. Nico Collins is the league's leading receiver. He's on IR. Guess who's the second leading receiver? Jamar Chase. Chase. Uh-huh. You can get him an offensive player of the year plus 900. The Bengals, with their terrible defense, they're going to need to pass the ball. Joe Burrow, he got injured last year. Comeback player of the year plus 650. So I like those long tail outcomes more than playing it safe here. Now, when it comes to this particular game, I think the Bengals are going to win, but I can't get there on this number. But I mean, you look at Burrow, 16-7-1 against the spread after a straight up loss, 11-3-1 against the spread. And I think typically when it comes to the Bengals, I think they're going to score points. And I think Daniel Jones is a better road quarterback than he is a home quarterback. So I probably would be laying it with the Bengals, maybe on some alternate numbers. You know, maybe they win this by, you know, six and a half or so. Telling you, Cincinnati wins the game. That number, that has 10 points Cincinnati lead written all over it with three minutes to go, and you're sweating out a backdoor cover. Remember I said that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. When we come back, we'll wrap it up. Best bets, week six. We got you covered. All right, before we get to best bets, Raheem, you're going to give us a two-for-one. Best bet plus a little boxing analysis. Let's hear 
All right, my best bet for the weekend, I'm going to go with the Chicago Bears minus one and a half against the Jacksonville Jaguars. I know a lot of people won't like it, but when you look at this Bears team defensively, they're a problem. I'm not buying this Jacksonville Jaguars team at all. So that's my first best bet for the boxing. This week, we got an undisputed light heavyweight championship fight between Arthur Better B and Demetrio Bevo. I'm going to go with over a half a knockdown. Minus 165. Somebody's getting knocked out in this fight. I think somebody gets stopped. I think it's going to be Demetrio Bevo, but I like a knockdown to happen in this fight. So that's my play. House, let's hear it, baby. I am being a wimp. I've got a money line parlay lined up here. We talked about both of these games. I'm taking San Francisco on the money line Thursday night against Seattle and putting it together with the Cincinnati Bengals. That is available on the FanDuel Sportsbook at plus 149. Just a money line parlay. Two wins out of two teams that we had well into the playoffs this upcoming season. I love how obvious that is, House. And I love the fact that I was thinking the exact same thing when it comes to what my best bet was going to be. But I have one more for you. So I'm with you. San Francisco, Cincinnati, don't get cute with the points. Give me an outright. Raheem, our best bets are going heads up here. I love Jacksonville in this game. Absolutely, (laughs) positively love Jacksonville in this game. Now all of a sudden there's this Caleb Williams Bears momentum after the last two weeks. They beat the crummy Panthers, and they beat the crummy Rams. Jacksonville's good in these London games. I know their defense stinks. I know they're giving up 90-yard bombs to Joe Flacco. Dream, I can't get on your level because I know your model and your bet is going to be a lot more than mine in this spot. But we maybe have a little dinner in Los Angeles on the line with this game because I am taking Jacksonville. I am on the Jags. Why are you so out on the Jags in London? All right, let's talk about this. Jaguars, 12th game overseas, 6-5 and five straight up and against the spread. So there's really no edge there. And when you look at the Bears, they produced 16 sacks throughout their five games, their top 10 in pressure rate. Last week, the Colts, the one game in which they've won, the Colts don't have a defense, and they have everybody banged up. So I think this is a step up in class for Jacksonville. I don't think the Jacksonville Jaguars defense is good at all. You're talking about a team that's 31st at EPA per play. So to me... This Jacksonville Jaguars defense is on par with some of the teams that the Bears have beaten. And I think Caleb Williams is improving as we go along. So I know it's risky with it being in London, but give me the Bears here. Oh, this is going to make for a very fun Ringer Sunday <laughs> pregame as Dream and I are heads up <laughs> in the classic Jag Bear showdown. That's going to do a freeze coast bias for Tucker and Stefan helping out. For Dream, Ops, JJ signing off. Enjoy the Niners and the Seahawks. Enjoy all the baseball. We'll see you Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern. Be good, everybody.